Welcome to this live where I'm going to be doing some post promotion talk about my course Heartbreak Grief Relief that just dropped. And also to make it incredibly practical, I'm also going to be talking about how to heal from a bad breakup, particularly if you dated someone with avoidant attachment. So while this live is now getting busier with people joining, firstly, thank you to those of you who are joining. Thank you to the people who bought my course on pre-sale. I really appreciate it. And this is going to be a space where I talk about the steps on how to navigate a bad breakup. Everyone's case is going to be a little bit different. Everyone's going to be at a different stage of a breakup recovery. And I'm also going to get all the technical stuff out of the way first. So that way, those of you who have bought my course know what's up. Those of you who have bought Heartbreak Grief Relief, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You can now find that in the email that you used to purchase the course because it went live 20 minutes ago and you've got everything set up for you there. Secondly, if you have any tech issues or any struggles, feel free to DM or email me. Me and my team will help you navigate how to work through that. Just as a reminder, it is not a substitute for therapy. You may also need more sophisticated solutions like medication or a professional to speak to like myself. If you feel that you need it, it really is just there to help you work through that first, most arguably difficult part of a breakup, which is the disbelief off the back of a bad breakup with someone like an avoidant attacher. So let's just dive in. If anyone has any questions with regards to how to heal from a bad breakup with someone like an avoidant attacher, feel free to ask me in the question box below because I will get through it as I'm talking through this entire life today. So first things first, the way I want to point out how to navigate a bad breakup with someone who is an avoidant attacher is it is like coming off hard drugs. It is one of the most painful things a person can go through, even if you left them. Many people often find that they are faced with so much depression, sadness, grief, frustration, hurt, longing, loss, sometimes suicidal ideation off the back of a bad breakup with someone they deeply cared about and thought was their person. Forget their attachment style just for a minute. Forget whatever pathology trauma they have. This person, for many people, was their world or your world. Someone you deeply cared about and someone who you may not ever feel you will get over again in quite some time. It is important to acknowledge that. For you, this individual could have been someone you thought was your soulmate and that is totally fair to feel as though this individual was someone who is special to you. There are many people in your world right now friends and family who may be well-intentioned, who will come to you and say things like, well, you just need to move on. Clearly, they just weren't that into you. That kind of advice is going to set you back tenfold in the sense that for a lot of them, if they didn't see or feel what you were going through, they are simply not going to respect what you went through with this person. It is a nuanced, complex, and also not a black and white sort of situation whatsoever to have dated someone like this. It is very hard to understand why someone who was telling you they were into you and cared for you would suddenly leave a relationship out of nowhere, even though they didn't look like there were anything, there were no serious red flags between the two of you. So it can be a huge shock to your system. Continued interaction with this person post breakup may be something you're tempted to do. Maybe you'll take them up on their offer to be friends. But it's important to understand that off the back of that, that can really cause you to still hold out on to hope that things are going to get better. I hate to break it to many people, but that hope is not going to get better anytime soon. Give it three months or six, that person is still probably not going to be any closer to wanting to be back with you. And even if they do, if they haven't worked through their avoidancy, the cycle will continue the next time they reach out. So please bear in mind that that hope may also act as a buffer from feeling the depression of the reality, which is it's not going to get better anytime soon. And this person has made a choice. And that is why if you do decide to keep interacting with this person during this shitty feeling of just being in withdrawal off the back of them, it can be like a massive dopamine hit to get a text from them, to be engaging with them when you're feeling low, which is normal. That's why I treat this like addiction recovery because your body is recovering off the back of a severe oxytocin withdrawal. Just really quickly, I want to take a pause. When this person, Anna Christian AGBK has asked, what about a friend breakup? You can include this in this category. Many people who've had severe breakups with people who have been close friends are also in this category too. And you may have had romantic feelings for them or you may not have had romantic feelings for them. It doesn't matter. The point is even close friendships can be devastating to your nervous system. Going back to what I was saying before, 
it's important to understand that when you have been with someone who has felt like your world, you've been lit up around them, it is so important to understand that your nervous system is often now in complete shutdown off the back of what's going on, and you may be craving more of them to help you feel better off the back of this. And that's why it's important to, in that absence of that person, to slowly lean off them one step at a time. No contact may be a bit extreme for a lot of people. I recommend for a lot of others to go low contact to start, and then to gradually go no contact because it is very, very hard to always go the way in being able to do no contact all the time. It's important to help you feel like you can slowly get your power back and also to help you feel like you're able to just slowly put a lot of the reminders, memories, songs, photos away, out of mind, out of sight for a period of time because it is very triggering to be seeing them all the time, stalking their socials, wondering what they're doing, who they're dating, it can make you go insane. And I get wanting to control and hold on to this, but it is so damn painful in the long run and can hold you back. And I understand if a lot of people do this during that stage because I've done it, not a fun experience, and it's really going to make you feel like you're just stuck. One thing I would recommend for a lot of people who I know are obviously part of my community is to get educated on what you think happened. Maybe they were a narcissist, maybe they're an avoidant, maybe they're someone with extreme anxious tendencies, but I would highly recommend that regardless of the pathology, just start educating yourself on some of the things that happened because many people are often blindsided and don't know what occurred, but answers to this can help. And that person who broke up with you probably won't be able to give you the answers that you're looking for. It's important to also understand that you need to also have a level of accountability for yourself during this process. You need to also be very mindful that you may run into your ex again. You may be co-parenting or even in a situation where, you know, this person is a colleague at work. And it's very hard to feel any mental health peace when you're still interacting with an individual like this, where there's still a lot of ambiguity, confusion around your relationship. There's no real clear way for me to be like, well, maybe you should quit your job or just leave you know, your home where you're staying with this person because the reality is not everyone can do that. And so for many people, it's gonna be a case of, well, how can I reduce my contact and in interaction with this person so I'm not so emotionally bothered by them because being around them clearly causes me to feel so triggered. For some people, that will be a termination of a job or even a lease if necessary to be able to support them in their recovery journey. Other people don't have that luxury and it just sucks. And it's really hard for many people to support their mental health during that phase. The next step that I really recommend for a lot of people with this is in the absence of this person, start doing an ick list. I highly recommend noting down all the little ways in which this person did not make you feel good and also really hurt you. It is so important to validate and honor that this person, even if they look like they were a saint, had the capacity to act poorly to you. For example, you can start with something as small as, I didn't like the way they looked after themselves because I didn't feel like I wanted to be a caretaker in the future. Or, I really didn't like the way they inconsistently communicated with me because it made me feel like I was stepping on eggshells. I did not like the fact that I constantly felt like I was having anxious flare-ups when they wouldn't get back to me in a consistent, reasonable manner. I felt like I was going crazy because this person would tell me one minute they love me and then the next minute would tell me that they never wanted to see me again and they couldn't be, ha you know, they would be far happier without me. When you write to some of those actions that have really hurt you, that allows you to validate in your mind that this person wasn't all perfect, that they actually had the capacity to do some really horrible things to you that really hurt you. So please honor that when you get the chance. Finally, it's also really important in this stage to start focusing on areas of your life that you may have neglected that you've been wanting to do for a while. That could include starting a new hobby, investing in a promotion at work, or even doing a project that you've been putting off on the back burner for a long time. Investing in things that bring you joy will also help remind you that this individual that you had been investing a lot of time, energy, and emotion into was not your only source of happiness. Yes, I wanna validate, these avoidant attaches will come into our lives where they can be and feel like the most incredible human beings you will ever meet. And I do not wanna take that away from anyone. 
these individuals that you are with will probably have some of the most profound transformative impact on you for the rest of your days to come. And you may look back at the breakup and go, I am actually kind of glad that happened because I needed that in order to be where I am today. And for many of you right now, you're probably not feeling that way at all. So I just want to empathize and say, if you are in a state of feeling extreme shock, betrayal, abandonment, and also a deep longing to be back with this person again, I completely get it. But at this time right now, the best thing you can focus on is what is going to bring you joy outside of this person to help you feel like you're not just constantly ruminating on this individual. So that's how I would navigate this disbelief part of your dating and sorry, of your dating of your breakup to help you feel as though you're able to get a bit more control and slowly lean off this person to a point where you may feel like no contact is achievable. So that's the purpose of my course, Heartbreak Grief Relief. Now, with that all out of the way, I'm happy to answer any and all questions about how you're navigating a breakup with an avoidant attacher. And at the end, if there are some questions specifically related to avoidant attachment that you're looking for clarity on, I may be generous enough to actually answer those as well too, because hey, why the hell not? And also shameless promotion. If you are looking to buy my course, Heartbreak Grief Relief, it is available now at its full price at $99.99. Uh, Australian dollars, and you can get that through the link in my bio, and that will be sent straight to your emails now. Anyways, let's dive straight in. So, uh, let's take a look. How do you move on when you have to see them often and you share kids with them? Communication about the kids with him is so hard, the avoidance comes through so much, and he also wants us to be friends and often acts so normal when he visits the kids. It's like being sucked into normality again. I'm going to start out by saying that fucking sucks. Like, I'm really sorry that you're in that situation because it can make you feel like you're just in limbo with this person and that, you know, on one hand, you know, even with their attempts to still be friends with you, you can still feel like things aren't quite over yet. It is a very confusing experience to be in when you've got that. Co-parenting with an avoidant attacher who doesn't want to maintain that level of intimacy and commitment with you can be absolute torture for you. So I can understand if it's a very difficult situation. I think the best thing that you can do, honestly for yourself, is do a variation of grey rocking where you just basically keep conversation very light with him, keep it very cordial, and just don't really give him much in order to really talk about other than shallow things like the weather and hobbies that you're enjoying too. Because it can be extremely frustrating to try and talk about the relationship, especially considering that it doesn't look like it's going to get better anytime soon and he may be avoiding that. And I would also highly recommend speaking to someone outside of this, whether it be a close friend who can empathize with this or even a specialist like a therapist to actually really process the emotions you're feeling. And they need to have an understanding of what you're going through because it's abject hell to go through this entire experience. So I can understand if this has been really, really, really hard for you. And like I said earlier, co-parenting or being with a colleague who has avoided attachment is brutal to go through. But one thing that I think does help, and this leads on to, is this leads into a bit of moving on from this person. With time, you will actually find that you actually get to a point where you become more increasingly frustrated with their avoidance and their emotional immaturity. And you may find that as a consequence of seeing that, you actually start to lose a lot of that, you know, hope for the future with them. And that can lead you on to that next stage of healing, which is the anger phase, where you start to really feel just frustrated with how they're treating you. And when you have that opportunity, highly recommend journaling or just voice memoing a lot of that anger out to really help you process that, you know, that vitriol that you have, because often they're in their capacity to meet you with intimacy, which is limited a lot of the time, can cause you to be like, I am so sick of putting up with the bare minimum from this person. And that can often help you just detach yourself emotionally and get back to a place of objectivity with this person. But again, tricky situation, probably recommend you definitely speak to someone else about it too. Sorry, someone else. I mean, someone like a therapist or a counselor or even a psychologist because it's so bloody hard to go through. Uh, Next question. Do breakups with avoidant partners hurt more than secure? Okay, this is a really good question. So it's just different. The reason that a partner, sorry, breakups with a more secure attached partner hurt differently is because usually there are known issues that are coming up that you're addressing together and trying to work on. And it can be the thing 
that ultimately separates the two of you because they're issues that just aren't going to be resolved together. In those situations, you've often found that a lot of that romantic feeling and also that, you know, willingness is starting to fade out over time. And you may just get to a point where you're like, look, I love my partner, but I've reached a point of indifference where I'm like, I can't be with this person anymore. And you may find that, you know, the breakup process doesn't have intense emotion around it. Many of my clients who've dated people for 15 years, 10 years, eight years, no matter how long with a secure partner, often report that they were just like, look, it is what it is. We ended our relationship. We knew what the issues were. I still love them, but I don't feel like, you know, too beat up about it. But when you have dated someone with severe avoidant attachment, I gotta tell you, everything, everyone in this community of mine will know what I'm talking about. When you have even been friends with someone like this, you have been dating someone for no more than like a few weeks and you weren't in an official relationship, to have that abrupt ending is something that will terminate your nervous system in a way that no other breakup probably will. A lot of my clients who've also gone through narcissistic abuse have said it's similar, but very different. When someone who is very avoidantly traded breaks up with you abruptly, it's a very acute pain. Essentially, you've gone through this phase typically where someone was giving you a lot of green flags and signs of love to show you that they really cared about you and that they really wanted a future with you. It can be really devastating to then have that rug pulled out from under you where you feel as though your world is just being turned upside down. The capacity to which these people can stare at you and look at you like no one else has and make you feel like you're so seen and visible and then a minute later run away from you and make you feel like you've just been abandoned is such an acute traumatic pain that I don't think even a secure attacher could even know how to handle something like that. Like I think most secure attachers when they break up with you, quite frankly, I don't think they have the capacity to do the damage that an avoidant attacher has when they decide to abruptly terminate something. So I just want to make that distinction to say when someone abruptly breaks up with you, that can reignite so much old trauma and baggage that you didn't even know about that may have made you feel needy, unlovable, abandoned, betrayed, and it's absolutely devastating to go through that. So I just wanted to portray how that difference can occur as a consequence of being with someone like that dependent on their attachment style. Next question, um, let's see. Is it typical for avoidance to keep dating new people over and over? How many cycles of it until they realize they need to look inward? What does rock bottom look like to them? I love these questions. So the thing we have to remember with avoidant attaches is that moving on to new people is something that they do when they don't feel good about themselves. So the classic one, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, is if you date an avoidant attacher, they abruptly dump you and they tell you, I'm not looking to date anyone new off the back of this. You find out a couple of weeks later, they're now hitched with someone new and it's devastating. The thing is, from people who I've worked with, with who have avoidant attachment and even Tyson, who was on my live um, last weekend, they've said to me, they don't like feeling, you know, that absence of being with a partner after a while. And if they don't want to go back to their previous partner, the first thing they'll do is they'll move on to someone new because a lot of them also future think there's many things that come up with this. Firstly, they don't, the trigger is they don't like feeling your absence. And they also often have a lot of grief and also sadness for how they're feeling without being around you. That acts as a trigger for them to want to act like I want to move on. I don't want to feel these feelings. I don't want to look in the past. I'm going to go out and find someone new. And often it may be a coworker, someone who's hung around with them for a while. They may go on the dating apps and find someone very quickly. And when they go and date with this person, it's important to understand that they're still carrying the emotional luggage of the previous experience they had with you into that. Now, without answering how that goes down, going back to the original question, how many cycles of this occurs? Oh, it can happen all the bloody time. Like, I mean, it can happen for so long and some of these people will be so damn in denial about the fact that they're doing this that it can be really difficult for them to acknowledge that they have an issue that they want to work on. So please bear in mind that, you know, you may unfortunately be a data point 
for them to realize they have a problem that they need to address. And if they're in the thick of their denial, they're not gonna wanna change that anytime soon. Some of these people do know that there's something not quite right, that they can't bond properly with people and they seem to turn away from love. But similar to someone who might, for instance, you know, be struggling with identifying their sexuality, but understandably have a lot of fear about coming out and identifying as gay, lesbian, bisexual, it's that thing of being like, I am actually afraid to admit this because of what it might mean about me and how I deal with this later. So it is an extreme case of haha avoidance for these individuals. And then going back to the other parts of that question, uh, what does rock bottom look like to an avoidant Natasha? Oh, this is... This is killer for a lot of them. So for, we have to understand a few things about this. For an avoidant attacher to compartmentalize and to suppress their emotions, it takes up a lot of energy for them and their body to do this. That stashed emotion and also stress that they keep in their bodies can manifest as chronic pain. Things like migraines, things like irritable bowel syndrome that goes on unaddressed for decades. And it can also lead to some life-threatening related challenges that may also manifest as physical illnesses that can actually take them to their grave. Many of these people can have a rock bottom where they're in hospital and realizing, holy crap, I now can realize how much of this stored emotion is responsible for all the stress in my body that's caused me problems throughout this entire life. So that's one variation. Another that can happen for many of them is that in a moment of quiet, when they're you know, managing all the chaos around them, they actually feel a moment of emotional constipation where they actually may grieve the loss of a previous relationship or situationship, and all that comes out of them, and they feel such tremendous sadness for what's occurred that they may actually go and repent to so many people in their lives, you know, asking for forgiveness. It's also very likely that for many of them, they may actually date another avoidant attacher and be looking at a mirror, and they're like, I can see what I've done and I can see how this has you know, impacted me. And many of these people often find themselves quite unfortunately, far too late, you know, in therapy. I've had some people where I've spoken to them and they're on the verge of collapse in so many areas of their lives. And they've kind of left therapy a little bit too late for them because it's like, well, you know, your jobs are failing, your friendships are failing, you're, you're in and out in these situationships or relationships with people who are abusing you and hurting you. And you've now got to a point where they've come to us in crisis and some of them are very suicidal and feeling very, you know, unsupported in their lives. And it's really just a sad case of the fact that so much for so many of them, they haven't actually created a life where they've ever felt as though they've been able to create authentic connections they've had a job that they really love and they felt like they could handle everything on their own. They didn't think that they needed to address some of these things until it got too late. So that is one of the brutal realities of rock bottom for so many of these individuals. And I have to say, having worked with a lot of avoidant attachers and I love working with them, the amount of grief and shame they feel for their actions is tremendous Some when they eventually allow themselves to feel it. And their road to recovery is long and it's not a particularly fun journey for a lot of them. But when they do work through it and they take their time through it, it can be one of the most rewarding processes for them too. So it's not all doom and gloom, but it is one of those things where it may take them a while before they realize they need to do something. A very common sign of them working through their rock bottoms is actually if they've been addicts, many avoidant attachers have huge addictions to alcohol, drugs, sex, work, and the burnout from that. And also going to anonymous programs often is what pushes them to realize, oh, I actually have trauma. Oh, there are some things from my past that I need to address. So you may find that becomes the turning point for many of these individuals. Next question. Uh, if they showed signs of self-awareness and decision to do better, is there a glimmer of hope? Maybe. I know that's a really vague answer, but the thing is... We have to understand too that someone realizing it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me, is awareness. Awareness in therapy for us, we love it. Like we, we as clinicians love when a client is aware of the things that they're doing to contribute to the mess that they're in. But when their trauma hits the fan, 
are they able to work themselves out of that and be like, oh shit, I just got activated. I need to fix this. You know, it's very easy to just have a conscious understanding of how your childhood plays out in adult dynamics. But if you aren't able to regulate and work your way down from a lot of that stuff, then your awareness is as good as useless because you don't actually know how to work through that stuff. So with that all being said, if an avoidant attacher shows self-awareness, congratulate them. It's an amazing step. And also see how far you can take it because at the end of the day, I worked with some couples on either end of the spectrum. Some have taken that awareness and gone like, oh crap, there's a few layers to my iceberg that I haven't even addressed that need to be sorted out and they can make phenomenal transformations. And there are others who are like, this is too uncomfortable for me, I'm gonna run and it's too hard for them. So please bear in mind the severity of one's trauma and also their unconscious patterns can play a huge role in determining their outcome of the relationship they have with you and with anyone else for that matter. So self-awareness is one thing, but it's not an indicator of long-term success. Uh, Let's see. How often does an avoidant partner come back? Is there a chance? (sighs) I mean, from what I've gathered with a lot of um, the clients that I've worked with and avoidant attachers that I've spoken to, The first prerogative is when they're feeling like crap is not usually to go back to you. Usually theirs is to be like, I need to move on and I'm going to try and, and I'm going to find someone else who I can, you know, get, you know, I can just show that I'm, I'm fine on my own. I can handle this. And so often they'll look for someone new before they turn around to you. And I'd say that, yes, there is a chance, but also when are they going to do that? Is this going to serve you? And also, would you want them back the same way that they were? And if you say yes, you're entirely entitled to say that. There's nothing wrong with that. But we have to remember, you're also inheriting their avoidant attachment, which may need to be also worked on because if that was the thing that got in the way of you working together, and of course, I'm not trying to deny anything you brought to the table that may need to be worked on as well. It's just important to understand that if those issues remain, the cycle will continue and you've got the same thing happening again. So something to think about. Uh, let's see. Oh. Um, let's see. What else have I got here? My avoidant ex and I recently met for lunch. When we broke up, he started therapy and now he has stopped therapy. It felt like it was a message to me that he was done with me because he knew my language of love was therapy. Can I just say, if someone has a love language of therapy, that's so, that's like, that's very cute. Like, I really appreciate that. Um, but I just want to say like, I can understand if that felt a bit like a blow to you because in terminating therapy, that almost meant that they were done with the relationship with you. Here's the thing. Um, I've had a lot of avoidant clients who have up and left me. Um, and I don't have, I have a funny feeling it wasn't because I'm bad at my job. Many clinicians also report this and there's a really good book on this called trauma and the avoidant client. The dropout rate for avoidance is quite high in therapy because remember they are also learning to be vulnerable with us as clinicians. A lot of them don't like that feeling of vulnerability and that becomes uncomfortable for them, so they choose to leave. So please bear in mind that if this person is terminated therapy, it's likely because the therapy was actually working and they may not have been ready for it. Or maybe the clinician was too fast with them. I find I have to go very slowly with my avoidant clients, take them on a bit of a journey before they're ready to do the deep inner work. So please bear in mind that for a lot of them, their willingness to engage in long-term therapy is something that's also going to be impacted by their own uncomfortability in actually being exposed the way that they are. It's a very uncomfortable step for many avoidant attachers. I can also see it. Like many of them are often just like visibly shaking when they're in the office and I have to be like, how are you feeling? And they often are like, oh, I'm fine. And I'm like, are you sure about that? And then I have to sort of unpack and be like, I think we need to take things a little bit slowly. So... All that is to say is that, you know, it's something that can be picked up on if you're aware of some of the patterns of that sort of stuff coming up. But we have to remember too, there are many clinicians who haven't been trained in how to pick this sort of stuff up and they may just, you know, dismiss it entirely as enthusiasm. I also know many avoidant clients who are like, yeah, I want to get into it. I want to like heal my trauma and work on my stuff only to leave like a week later. It's important to understand that many of these people rush in to therapy with the same enthusiasm they rush into relationships and that also is coupled with a lot of their anxiety of being vulnerable. So it's one of those things where it can be, unfortunately, a double whammy for us as it is for you. And avoidant 
terminations in therapy are not fun for us as clinicians either. It's, it's pretty brutal. So anyways, that answers that. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else that I want to add from my question box here. Oh, here we go. Two years later, um, my partner reached out. We have been doing deep, long meetings, but no intimacy. Should I ask about his feelings, intentions, or will he run? I can feel the feels, but he has not addressed what this is. Okay. If your avoidant partner is dismissing your... Sorry, it's not dismissing. It's just sort of not wanting to explore their feelings. I've got one of two things that I would say to you. You can respect maybe the, I suppose distance from communicating his feeling or his or her feelings to you by not actually, you know, wanting to go there. If they're purposely sort of like not wanting to go into how they're feeling towards you, probably a sign that they're not wanting to do that. However, this leads me on to the next part, which is, do you want to wait around for this person to actually disclose how they're feeling? And it's not an easy question. There's no right or wrong answer. Some people will be like, you know what? I'm willing to give it a while just to see how they feel about me. But for others who've done this rodeo before, they're like, nah, -uh. you either want me or you don't. Avoidant attachers, a lot of them, suffer from extreme ambivalence and they're not very good at often making their own decisions for themselves in some of these cases. So when it comes to also being attuned to their feelings, you may feel, this is a very intuitive thing and I think all, everyone here will know what I'm talking about. You can feel generally how they're feeling sometimes better than they feel about themselves. So you may know that this person has actually a feeling like positive feelings for you, but they're just not talking about it or communicating it. And that's why it's really important where you actually may feel the point where you're like, listen, I really respect and care about you. And I can feel that you also care about me too. I just want to let you know that I do feel like there's a bit of distance and also maybe fear of intimacy between us. And if that's the case, I respect where you're at but it does impact my investment in wanting to actually continue things with you. That's a very firm boundary that you can have if you do want to actually move in the other direction. They may not like that because they may feel controlled that you're trying to force them into something that they don't like. But the reality is you have to remember too that, you know, do you want to stick around for their awakening and transformation? Some of them are not going to do that. Anyways, I am going to now start answering some of the questions that I'm getting in the chat because there are a lot and I know English and I want to um, answer some of those. Firstly, thank you again to everyone who's here today and also participating in this live. It's great to have this turnout twice in a row from yesterday into today. And it's so good also to be answering some of this stuff. So let's continue going. Uh, can I just say to, I don't know if this user is still here, Rebel Fleur 555 cross my boundaries and I'm out. I guess I'm avoidant. That's hilarious. Um, as someone who has been no stranger to cutting people out where my boundaries have been crossed, I feel you there. So I just want to say, love that vibe. I don't think that necessarily makes you avoidant though, but um, I think there, there comes a stage where you do eventually get quite ruthless with your boundaries after you've been you know, crossed a few too many times as someone who maybe even be a bit anxious, leaning their way more into being secure. So all I'm gonna say is it's a phase for a lot of people too, but avoidant attaches, I will say for a bit of nuance, can be quite bad at discerning boundaries from blocking people, meaning they may come up with these really random boundaries to try and like avoid conflict with people. And that's not a boundary. For example, you might have a friend who abruptly tells their entire friendship group that I need you to tell me if you're coming to me with anything emotional, rather than saying, hey, I just wanna let you know, I really appreciate the fact that you trust me enough to talk to me about your stuff. I have to be honest, I'm going through a lot right now that's really hard for me and I don't have the capacity to actually speak about what you wanna talk with me about. I suggest you speak to maybe a professional about it because I just don't have the capacity to do that for us right now. Can you see the difference in the language that one is about control? The other one is about negotiation and being like, hey, just want to let you know how I'm feeling. There is a big distinction between sending a group message to everyone online versus having that conversation in person and actually sitting with that per and letting that person sit with the discomfort of your boundary. Just want to put that out there. Uh, how can I stop having intrusive thoughts about details about the breakup? It's been eight months and I get frustrated at times. This is gonna sound oxymoronic. Let those intrusive thoughts happen. It's really good to actually be very mindful of them. One thing I actually do with a lot of my clients is I often say to them, think of those thoughts 
like credits in a cinema, which are just floating through your head. Just be like, okay, I'm just gonna detach myself from all of this stuff and just be like, just letting it go through. It's really important to understand that for many people, it's easy to get stuck in ruminating on a lot of the, the thoughts and the rabbit holes and the discombobulation of what's happened when you were with this person. And there may actually be a, a time for you to actually write down some of those answers for yourself and just be like, right, this is what I'm going to believe in for the time being. And I'm going to move on from this too. I find resisting it really causes a lot of struggle for a lot of people. So please be mindful of that if that's something that you're finding is really hard to, um, to navigate. And then next question, how can I end my friendship with my ex avoidant without causing additional major feelings of abandonment? I tried to cut him off and freaked out. So I'm trying the friendship, but it's brutal. I'm assuming that this person was your partner or someone you were seeing before they decided let's be friends and you don't want to cause the major feelings of abandonment. Okay, I have a few things to say to this. One is that if this friendship with your ex-avoidant is something of a bit of a placeholder for the two of you and you're getting to a point where you're like, I need to cut this, there are ways to do that without abandoning them, so to speak. One thing I find that really helps is to just gradually keep enforcing your boundaries being like, listen, I'm here for you in this capacity. I'm like, I'm available, you know, one day a week if they're, you know, worried about you leaving them. Like just being like, listen, babe or friend, I'm here for you. I don't have the capacity to give you the same amount of time and energy that we had when we were seeing each other. This is all I can offer you at this particular time. If they respond badly to that, let them sit with that discomfort. It'd be like if you were also having this conversation with someone with severe anxious attachment. We have to remember too that a lot of avoidant attachers also still have a fear of abandonment, although it's more subconscious. And if it gets to a point where they're continuing to push your boundaries, you can eventually say, listen, I feel like we've gone over this many times. This is really getting to a point now where I can't sustain this and I'm choosing to walk away from this for my own mental health and I wish you all the best. Sometimes, and this is the cruel thing in some ways, but it's also a blessing in disguise, People need to, to feel in that pain and realize they've also enabled and contributed to their own... Sorry, let me start that again. It's important for some people to actually realize that they're in their own pain because they've also caused this to occur as well too. Through their own actions and their own behavior, they have also gotten to a place of realizing that they have caused this issue to occur. That is why it is so important to be mindful of the fact that you're actually doing them a favor by choosing to step away after enforcing your boundaries maybe three times. I like the three year out rule because if they can't you know, accept the fact that they can work with you on that known issue, then maybe it's better for them to actually sit with the discomfort of realizing, shit, what have I done? I feel like I contributed to this. Maybe I need to work on this for myself too. So you actually might be doing them a favor by terminating things after you've negotiated your boundaries around this. Uh, let's keep going. What else have we got here? 30 years of friendship. We were pretty much like brother and sister, but realized I was co-parenting and enabling bad behavior. That can happen. I know that's not a question, but unfortunately it's one of those things where it can happen and it's just crap to feel like you're doing that. And it's not a fun experience to go through. Let's see what else have we got here? Cause I'm going to go back to the question box in a minute. How to deal with cutting off the same circles of friends after the breakup. Any thoughts? Oh, so you're talking about friends of your avoidant partner. <sighs> that can be tricky. So I guess one thing that I've recommended to people and I've done myself is you can just message them on social media being like, listen, or you can, you know, confront them over breakfast or coffee and just say, hey, I want to let you know that I would love to maintain my interaction with you at this time. I just don't have the capacity to do that because of our closeness to the person I was seeing, your friend. So I'm choosing to just step away for a while and this is what I'm going to do for the foreseeable future. Leave it at that because at the end of the day, you know, you're respecting them by saying, it's not you, it's just how I'm feeling in relation to this person that's part of our inner circle. And I think that's actually a respectful way to do it. Or 
you can try and see if they'd be open to interacting with you if you feel like it's okay. I know a lot of people can't do that and it's hard for them, but if you feel that you can maintain a, what I call, boundary relationship with that friend where you're like, we're just not gonna talk about that person who we're mutually close to and it's gonna be a, you know, a friendship that's exclusively connected to us, go from there. Uh, let's see. After a month of him abruptly breaking up with me, I wished him happy birthday and he mentioned long distance and was hard and wanted to see me again and we will still talk again. I am confused. Should I wait? <sighs> it's the age old question. Short answer is, you know, even if I told you, no, don't, you probably will anyways. And even if I tell you, well, you can wait, I know everyone in the comments is gonna be like, no, don't do that, it's a waste of time. Here's the thing. I think you've got a lot of evidence to suggest here that this person does not know how to make up their mind. This person has abruptly broken up with you and is now telling you that it's hard and they wanna see you and talk with you. That suggests to me that this person does not know what they want and also is not very clear of how their attachment has led to this. So I think the question for you is, how much longer am I willing to put up with this before I feel like it's too much for me? Please bear in mind that that might be the thing that you need to focus on for the time being in order to, you know, to navigate this particular stage of where things are at. So just thought I'd share that with you. Because at the end of the day, it might be a case of like, I'm willing to wait this out for like a month or two, but after that, I'm done. Keep tabs on yourself too emotionally. If you feel like after a month or two, it's not getting better, I think that's a clear indicator that it's not gonna get any better anytime soon. Uh, next question is, I have a really, oh wait, no, this isn't a question. This is a statement. I have a really avoidant partner. I'm stuck in a loop of constant one-sidedness and him blaming me and never ever taking responsibility and constant projection and just a lot of deflection. It sucks. Like really, it sucks. And look, I want to validate you by saying, look, it's really shitty when that happens because yes, I'm sure that there might be something that you're doing that you also need to be thinking about too, in terms of how this is being engaged and enabled and all that sort of stuff too. But just for a minute, it sucks to actually have a partner where you feel like, you know, you're constantly on a one-sided battle where you're fighting for the relationship and they're also just never taking accountability for themselves. So if that's how you're feeling, I'm really sorry that you feel like you're not part of a team. You're essentially doing a one-man sports show, which is never fun. Next question. Haunted by images of her with new partner, she told me she loved me but needed to be alone to heal, then was with someone new seemingly committed within weeks. The hurt is too much. I'm really sorry that you're going through that. I feel like every client I've spoken to this week has literally gone through this moment like this week. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's in the air for these people to be like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to go out and find someone new to help me get over the person I was with. It's terrible. And I think particularly... For a lot of people, it can make you feel like you never mattered at all. You're invisible. You are someone who's not good enough for the person that you dated. And it's a really awful experience to go through. So I'm sorry that you've had that happen to you because it can make you feel like your time together never meant anything at all. I will say that's not quite accurate for these avoidant attachers. They do remember you. But the feeling you have inside of you can bring up so much trauma of not being chosen or not being good enough for that person in the first place. Uh, let's see. It's been a year since my ex of two and a half years broke up with me because his parents did not accept me. Now he is engaged to someone of their choice. I'm heartbroken and angry still. Of course you are. I think that's totally fair. If you were chosen by your partner and then their parents intervened, that's just fucking unfair. Like, I think you have every right to be upset about that. It's frustrating. It's not okay. It's unfair. Whether you can do anything about it is an entirely different matter. I wouldn't recommend doing anything, but what I would say is it's still shitty to have to go through that. So again, sorry you have to go through that because it's an awful thing to go through. Uh, my ex said he typically presented as anxiously attached in relationships, but with me, I feel like he was definitely avoidant. Could my anxious attachment style have triggered his style to shift? No. Uh, I mean, maybe, but like not that much. I mean, unless you were like, okay, so for a bit of context, I obviously don't know you. I don't know the dynamic of your partner. Let's assume for a minute, you're actually not that anxious. Severely anxious attachers are incredibly passive aggressive. They'll go silent on you whenever you've done something to upset them and they won't explain what's wrong. They may find ways to guilt trip you. 
they'll say things like, I'm leaving you if you don't fix this as a way of trying to prevent you from leaving them in the first place. They have a tendency to start fights to try and control the relationship. And they also have a tendency too to manage and micro, sorry, micromanage and control your movements in and around the space that you might be cohabitating. For example, you might be living with them and anytime you're like, babe, I want to go back to my place, they're like, oh, so you're just going to leave me. And they find ways to just threaten you to stay with them because their fear of abandonment gets like hyper activated. Severe anxious attaches, you know, it's a really engulfing experience. So if that's something that you resonate with, I could understand this person's, you know, maybe more avoidant parts starting to play up a bit. But let's just say hypothetically, no. Then on this instance, I'd say... I think that it could be a case that he was dating people where he felt like he was treading on eggshells around them. But we also have to remember too that avoidance also is a form of anxiety. Many avoidant attachers don't even realize that they have like so much anxiety going on that's contributing to their avoidant patterns of behavior and also to the partners they pick too. So it could speak also to the fact that he wasn't aware that he had an avoidant part to him. It may not have actually had anything to do with you, so to speak, like sure your interaction with him may have also brought that avoidant part out of him. Many clients who identify as fearful avoidant tell me that once the anxiety was settled, that's when the avoidancy started to kick in and things started to take a shift in the other direction. So he could be disorganized. Uh, how to handle no contact when there is so much left in limbo, like finances and belongings left in the home, not the first time this has happened. Yeah, I look I'm not really an expert in that particular part because I think that it is really brutal to go through. I would say that if you're navigating no contact when there's so much left in limbo, like mutual things between the two of you, I think it's really about communicating one step at a time being like, hey, we need to sort this out. I will say from my own experience with clients who've gone through similar experiences where they're still negotiating their stuff back, you it really can be very hard at times to get the avoidant partner at times to actually take responsibility and do the thing. They'll tell you, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it. And they never do. So you may have to step it up to try and get them to actually, you know, take care of the belongings that they haven't taken care of, the finances and separate those if they combine it with you, for instance. And it may mean you have to be quite assertive and also at times maybe demanding to get them to take charge on it because they can be terrible at times in terms of navigating that depending on their level of maturity, you know, sorry, depending on their levels of maturity with you in the relationship. I'm going to answer one more question and then I'm going to go and get lunch because um, I'm hungry and that's my boundary for the day. But I'm going to actually answer this question because it's a great one. How to deal with starting over, making friends or moving to a new place in your 40s? I work with a lot of clients who are in their 40s and have to start over and it's not fun. Um, and I want to validate and say it's a really awful experience to feel like everything's crashed and burned and now you've got to start over again, which is usually the case for a lot of my clients with this. It's a bit of a crazy thing how this often happens to people. But I think one of the best things you can do is firstly, work on your emotional well-being and also your financial stability too. There are a few areas of your life that you probably want to prioritize. Like for example, getting some stability and order in your life. Even if you hate your job, maybe just having something that allows you to pay the bills is sufficient for now. Just so that way it's like, okay, cool. That's one stress I don't have to worry about. Maybe I'll look for a new job like down the line. Also take the time to process a breakup as well too. That takes months sometimes to work through. So maybe looking at content like mine and speaking to a therapist, if you can afford it, will allow you that peace of mind to be like, okay, I think I can release from this. And then in terms of making friends in a new place, I would highly recommend apps like Meetup or even just, you know, going to local, you know, things that are going on in your area to really help you to get a sense of community. And I would even use the dating apps, oddly enough, to make friends. Make it very clear that you're looking for friends to connect with. Bumble does that. I know I've used Tinder and Hinge for that before too. And it's been a great way of actually connecting with people who've now turned into lifetime friends. So there are ways that are a little bit what I call unconventional to help you with that. And you may even find that just by rejigging your lifestyle, instead of going to the gym, maybe going to something like F45, which is more group orientated, 
helps you to get a new sense of community that just shifts things enough to the point where you're like, okay, I feel like I can get myself back on my feet again too. Because it is very hard to start over no matter what decade you're in. Although I will say, I think it does get a bit harder to, like the further down the line that you go, which I respect. So I know that's not a pleasant feeling to go through. Anyways, everyone who's joined, thank you very much. I really appreciate you being part of this live that I've done to you know promote my course that I released today. If you are looking to download it, please feel free to go to the link in my bio where you can access it and take it from there. Other than that though, guys and girls, thank you very much. And I will be back on here for another live down the road.